You don't want to miss it, this episode of Open at Microsoft, where I have one of the founder of Omnibore, Ed, with me. Let's dig into it. Hey, Ed. So tell us more about Omnibore. So have you heard about SBOM, Software Bills of Material? You know what? No. <laughs> uh, all right. So th there's a big movement afoot trying to provide greater supply chain security um, in our, in our, in, across the industry at this point. So you may have heard of things like the Colonial Pipeline hack that occurred a couple of years ago, things like log for shell which recently rocked the industry. And what's increasingly becoming clear to people is that the majority of the security surface for your software is not actually your software. It's the other things that you pick up from the software supply chain down the line. Those are actually the places where most of the vulnerabilities are coming from. And those things beg one initial question to begin with, which is, so what exactly am I getting from third parties that I'm building into my software? That's true. And this question turns out to be profoundly more complicated than you would like it to be. And so there's been a movement afoot to construct what's called a software bill of materials, which captures all kinds of information about the software that gets built into your software. It attempts to capture the name, version, and supplier of components. It will capture who you're supposed to contact if there's a problem with it. It'll capture some information about the open source licensure. It will capture a whole bunch of metadata about the software that goes into your software. But it turns out that constructing this at high fidelity is hard because often what you have is just the software you're given and figuring out what came before can be very difficult. And there's a whole set of attempts trying to do this with scanners. They often produce both false positives and false negatives, which means that someone will report that you actually contain a software component that you don't, which means that your downstream consumers will now complain about you needing to fix CVEs or security vulnerabilities that you don't even have the component for. Or they may sometimes miss things that you actually do contain. And so vulnerabilities that you have, you may not know to fix by upgrading or applying a patch. So what Omnivore does, Omnivore stands for Universal Bill of Receipts. The BOR is Bill of Receipts. Is okay. we attempt to introduce just one very simple skeleton, not for the metadata, which is important and interesting that you get from the S-bombs, but literally for at every single build step, what are the inputs transitively all the way up so you can, ca you can capture the full artifact dependency graph for what you've built. Okay. So a really good way of sort of looking at what we mean by an artifact dependency graph, if you could show the screen really quickly. Yeah, sure. Can see is it now. Take a simple C program, right? And in a simple C program, you may have a C file and a bunch of .h files that get compiled up into a .o file. And you may do that across many .o files. Mm -hmm. Those then get linked up into an executable. And so this is sort of the artifact dependency graph of the executable. Now, when you run that, you actually get an even more interesting artifact dependency graph because in addition to the things that went into the executable that you ran, the running executable may also dynamically link shared libraries. And for those, you would also like to know exactly what went into them. And so what Omniboard does is it provides for you a scheme for capturing at build time those inputs and carrying them forward just as identifiable things. Make sense so far? It's at build time. That's cool. I, I like, okay, I didn't catch that initially. So it's at build time that it does that. That's pretty cool. Well, it, it, it turns out build time is the only time you can actually know some of this information, right? So if I would like to know yeah. what C and H files go into that O file, the entity that knows that is the compiler. It's the one that actually knows what went in there. And so because of this, instead of thinking about the world in terms of components, which can be these giant bags of things. Like if you think about the Linux kernel, you know there are tens of thousands of files in the Linux kernel. You don't even vaguely build all of those into a kernel. And you can think of these components that the SBOMs talk about as parts bins. 
right? They're bins out of which you pick some of the parts that you build into things. Omnivore actually reasons about the world in terms of artifacts, software artifacts. Mm -hmm. And these, as it turns out, are the things that you're usually interested in at the end of the day. And they can be things like source code files of any language, object files that get built, shared object files, Java class files, jar files, um, executable files, container images. All of those things we think of as artifacts in the omnivore world. And so the very first question you should ask yourself is, when do we decide the two artifacts are the same, right? And because there are a lot of ways of thinking about this and not all of them end up being good ideas. So for example, you may decide that two artifacts are the same if they have the same file name and they're in the same place in your directory structure. But that doesn't really tell you anything interesting. Their contents could be completely different. And so we reason about them being the same if and only if they've got the same set of bytes. And then we identify them using the git object ID of the artifact. So you've used Git, correct? Yep. Awesome. So it turns out Git is not so much a source code management system as it is an object store. And every file, every directory, every commit, every tag is stored as an object with an object ID. Um, and since the source code files are all indexed up in GitHub and every place else we keep them with object IDs, and because those object IDs are easy to compute completely independent of Git, we use them to identify everything in the artifact dependency graph, whether it's the source code files, the object files, the executables, the containers, whatever it is, that's what we use to identify it. Okay, so everything has already a, a mm -hmm. Git uh, ID, object ID. Mm -hmm. So like you're just reusing that to make sure like you're, 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 then you're able to identify all the component and then bubbling up if you need to. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And so all Omnivore really does is if you've got some generic artifact dependency tree, dependency graph, we use those artifact IDs, which are the Git object IDs to identify the artifacts. And then we construct this input manifest um, to capture the parent-child relationships. And the input manifest is very simple. If I've got a leaf artifact, like a, a phi, so for every input that comes into an art, a particular output, so for every source code file that goes into an auto file, you capture a single line. And that line is either of the form blob and then the getoid of the input, if in fact what you're dealing with is a source code file that has no structure, or if you're dealing with something further up the tree, like a .o file going to an executable, you go through and you capture not only the input file, but you capture the getoid of the omnivore document or input manifest for that input file. And so you get things that end up looking you know, like just a series of lines. This is very simple for the compiler to actually produce. And when you get to the end of that, when a build tool gets to the point where it's writing an output artifact, Omnibor calls for the build tool to embed that very small identifier for its input manifest into the output file. So in an ELF file, you might embed it as a dot bomb section in the ELF file, for example. So that if I hand you an executable, what you have there is the receipt, right? That says, okay, this is the artifact dependency graph. The artifact dependency graph will be the same for the same build because it's only capturing the immutable identity information. And then when it comes to things like SBOMs, um, you can actually, in Omnibore, help make those more reliable because for the SBOMs, you can treat the SBOM information as metadata about the particular um, artifacts. So rather than having embedding all this the metadata that can be highly variable into the artifact dependency graph, I can have an identifier in my SBOM that points mm -hmm. to the particular Git object ID for the artifacts information in the artifact dependency graph. So you can maintain this precision, this skeleton, but you can bring the metadata in your SBOM or in other kinds of metadata sources to point into the, uh, the artifact dependency graph. We've talked to people who are interested in using this for indexing known files that are known to be of lower performance. So you can actually look at an executable and say, well, you know, you should probably update this because it should be more performant if you would update to a newer file here. 
Um, the same with energy efficiency for sustainability uses have been discussions that have been out in the community. And so that really is sort of where you wind up with Omnibor is this very, very simple um, concept of just building out these artifact dependency graphs and capturing them from the build tools and embedding that information as you move up the tree. That's great. So since it's, you know, a lot of it at app and at build time, so how many languages are supported right now? Um, so right now we actually have some proof of concepts for um, Clang and LLVM and LLVM LLD, so building C and linking it. Likewise for um, GCC and bin utils, so building C and linking it. Um, as part of that work, there's actually been some work done on raw assembler as well, because okay. it turns out when you go to, to build this against things like the kernel, you wind up with issues with raw assembler. There's some work that's being done right now in the community in Java, which is Java is very interesting because it's dynamically loaded. So unlike um, where I might get an executable and that would be the interesting thing in Java, I, it turns out you can instrument the class loader in a running JVM so that you can construct dynamically the omnivore trees and introspect um, the artifact dependency graphs based upon which class files have been loaded into the system. Um, we have some work ongoing right now for Python. Um, there's been work done on Rust and Go. And right now, these are all in sort of a proof of concept stage, but the goal is to move this work upstream to those particular runtime and build tools so that basically at the beginning of the day, you set an environment variable like Omniborder, That's great. and then you don't think anymore. Because the last thing we need as open source developers is more work to do. You've already seen some pushback from people complaining about all the new requirements the supply chain security folks would love to layer onto them. And we're all very busy. And so Omnivore is just saying, look, set a freaking environment variable and be done with it. So where people can go and learn more to get started, or maybe just like, check if they, they would consider using Omnibor in their project. Yeah, so basically, um, we have an Omnibor website at um, omnibor.io, uh, sometimes pronounced Omniborio because it's fun. Um, and there's a community tab right at the top of it, and that will tell you how to get involved. It will point you to where to find our Slack channels, our Twitter, a calendar of community meetings. Those all contain the agendas so you can get to them. And so it's a fairly active community. Um, as I said, we've got folks, oh, I also forgot to mention, we have some work that's been done in .NET as well. Um, so we, we've got folks from all over the place who are interested because it really feels like it scratches an itch, like it solves a problem. And it gives you something you can grab a hold of that's powerful. Awesome. So we'll make sure to make to put all the link into the description so people can join that marvelous community. And uh, thank you, Head, for your time today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Hey, I'm Kadesha, and I'm here to let you know that May is Maintainer Month. At GitHub, we're celebrating maintainers all month long by providing a place to gather, share, and learn together. Come join our month-long events and activities to be a part of the celebration and share your story with other maintainers and join the maintainer community. We have workshops, podcasts, conferences, meetups, and much more planned for you to enjoy all month long. Go to maintainermonth.github.com to see and create your schedule and be a part of the celebration. See you there.